Well, everyone, thanks so much for showing up again. This is our third EL staff member meetup. Thanks for being in some downtown today with the traffic and the parking situation and the elevator situation. So, but at least we have AC. If you went to our other two meetups, uh, the AC situation wasn't the best. So, thanks everyone for being in. I hope you're going to enjoy the program. We have two presentations. We have Ross from the Sense team, so he's the college engineer with our team. And we have Ira from WorkPoint that we're presenting today. So we're looking forward to that. Just some uh, quick housekeeping things, I guess. Uh, we're grateful to WeWork. Uh, thank you, WeWork. Thanks so much for you know, recording everything over here. Uh, you met Rebecca on the way up. Is she around? Some around. But uh, she's our events manager. She's doing a wonderful job in helping us coordinate these things, so we're very grateful to them. And then just for Sense, for sponsoring some tacos. So we always enjoy tacos. So thank you, Sense, for that. So we're going to get started. Uh, we have two presentations today. One of them is uh, Ross. He's in with an updated okay. encrypted title. <laughs> so we're going to let him start. Thank you, everyone. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. So yeah. Uh, so before we get started, um, how many people here are like developers, engineers? Okay. And how many people have like experience with uh, Writing decentralized applications. Okay, a little, a little here. Okay, uh, and who has experience with EOS? All right. So I'm just trying to figure out how uh, how bored I'm gonna be making you guys do this. Um, so yeah, uh, I was originally going to be giving a talk called Global Coin, and uh, it was a talk on a little project that I was doing. Um, and I had some technical difficulties, uh, which uh, are preventing me from presenting the project today. So instead, I'm just going to be kind of talking about some of the uh, things I have observed and learned while uh, working on developing smart contracts for uh, EOS. And by developing, I mean failing to develop uh, one. So uh, next slide, please. So about me, um, I work at Sense with Angel, as you mentioned. Um, I'm a software developer. And uh, up until now, I've primarily worked with Ruby, uh, Elixir, JavaScript on sort of pretty traditional web apps, and still, for the most part, do. By not getting into C++ and decentralized stuff, uh, you know, as, uh, as you guys are all interested in. Uh, so, yeah. Nobody noticed that that's not. Who is that person? <laughs> I have no idea. I just want to do it with you. Yeah, none of these people are being. No, not that I know. Um, okay, so yeah, next slide. Right, so um, I, for me, like, and this is just from my perspective, uh, the only thing that I've been familiar with uh, so far is Ethereum. And so obviously there are some like, pretty large differences between the two of them at the protocol level. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with them. I mean, if you're interested in this stuff at all, you will have heard that you know, uh, EOS is uh, a delegated proof of stake versus Ethereum's uh, proof of work. You know, there's some governance differences, or you know, rather features in EOS uh, uh, that deal with governance. Uh, EOS is supposed to be more scalable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't want to talk about that stuff um, because this is a DAP developers meetup, and I'm a developer. And what I really want to know about is like what's it like to work with EOS. What's it like to develop smart contracts? And what does EOS provide to uh, a smart contract developer? So um, I'm just going to go through some of the things that um, I've learned, some of the differences, and then do, uh, I won't call it a demo because it's not really a demo, but uh, I will, yeah, sort of demonstrate some concepts. Um, so yeah, next slide. So yeah, the contracts. Uh, the contracts, I think, are pretty interesting. I guess if I was going to sort of characterize them in one word, I'd say EOS is like a little bit more opinionated or higher level, and Ethereum seems a little bit lower level, and what I mean by that is, uh, next slide. Um, so, yeah, obviously the language difference right now, um, if you're writing a EOS contract, I think you have to write C++. I don't know if anybody has figured out uh, the compiler situation for other languages, but it, it, at the end of the day, it's all about assembly, and so eventually, hopefully, you'll be able to write whatever language you want uh, and, and write smart contracts. Um, I don't uh, know how you all feel about C++, but, 
maybe you're happy using it, maybe you're not. Um, I'm very new to it, I'm an excellent thing, so um, it's really got a plus or minus for me at this point. But the more interesting thing is the way that uh, EOS uh, roles and permissions work. So um, in Ethereum, as you probably know, like there's, the, it's, it's very low level. There's basically public private key pairs, and that's kind of it. And you can, of course, build things on top of that. Um, if you want to build sort of permissions or some other sort of higher level account scheme, you can do that, but they kind of leave it up to you to do that. Whereas with EOS, they have uh, sort of more, I guess, robust and standardized um, permissions. Uh, so the way that works is you have an account, uh, and your account is like a user-friendly, human-readable string, basically. Uh, and then that's kind of owned by these um, uh, key pairs, which are, um, so, at the, so the base contract has, um, or the, I'm sorry, the base ad, uh, address has basically two. They have a, an owner and a, um, an active key, uh, owner being like the you know, one you want to keep um, being exposed to people, and so you can revoke the active key. Which I can see use with applications day to day. Uh, and then they also have, um, in addition to this, the ability to give, so that developers can uh, basically implement you know, arbitrary permissions. They can create their own uh, for whatever their application is. So maybe you have like a, you're building some kind of a decentralized uh, exchange and you want to have uh, you know, one permission for, um, I guess, like you know, putting up uh, orders and you will have want to have another one for doing. Um, Withdrawals, you know, that it gives you the ability to do that. Uh, so I, I think it's a pretty big win, actually. I mean, if you think of EOS as an operating system, uh, which everyone like it seems to be the, the terms in which we talk about it, it's uh, good to have these sort of higher level cons uh, constructs to, to build apps on top of. So I, I, I like kind of we think it's pretty, pretty positive, pretty cool. Um, so okay, next slide. Uh, so yeah, if we're talking about decentralized applications and smart contracts, one of the biggest, in my opinion, uh, applications of this so far, like kind of the killer app on Ethereum has been the ERC20 tokens. And you know, your opinion on this might, might differ from mine, and some people think they're a, a bad thing. Uh, but you know, the, the tokens and the ICOs and all this stuff that we've been seeing over the past year or two years has like been a major thing. It's kind of the, the first, like, you know, application that's seeing broad uh, adoption in, in this space. And so uh, I think EOS is definitely trying to um, sort of eat up some of that, that pie with uh, what I'll, I'll call EOS, EOSIO.token. It's basically a boilerplate contract that they provide to you. Uh, so you don't need to go off and implement your own uh, standard for, for tokens. And uh, it's um, you know basically part of a host of uh, Libraries, I guess you call them, and then other boilerplate contracts, which do other things like you know, if you're trying to build a social network or uh, you know, exchange or do things like identity. Uh, they have these sort of pre-made boilerplate uh, contracts that are right in the source code, and you can go and uh, use them as you wish. Um, so let's uh, move on to the next one. So if you are to go into uh, the contracts folder of your EOS source code, you'll see this uh, EOSIO uh, token amongst all this other mess. This is where the other contracts and other uh, libraries live. But basically today I'm just going to be talking about you know, tokens, how do they work, what, how can you do the equivalent of an ERC20 token on EOS. Um, and so if you go into that, fol uh, into that folder, uh, you'll see uh, a bunch of C++ files, uh, including this header, and you'll see that it exposes these three uh, public methods, uh, create, which is uh, allows you to create a new uh, create a new uh, token. And so the way this works is a little bit different. With the ERC20 uh, tokens, you are sort of publishing one the one one token, one contract, essentially. Uh, whereas this uh, contract allows you to have a single instance of, of the contract running have multiple tokens on it. So that's a little bit different in that respect. So this, this method creates you know, creating a new token on a running instance of, the, uh, of this contract. And then you also have issue, which is um, the way you issue the token. So say um, you know you want to give them several uh, accounts, then you're going to need this method to, uh, to uh, issue those. And then the, the last one is pretty self-explanatory transfer. So when you want to trade or uh, uh, transact, you'll, you'll be calling this method. That's, uh, that's pretty much it for the public interface. Uh, so moving on. Uh, so yeah, 
Um, so t I just want to run through this little example, not a demo, uh, but an example, uh, to sort of explain how easy this is and how simple uh, EOSIO.token makes things for you. So what you can do, and this just um, to sort of clarify, this is uh, given um, that a, a running contract is already published to an account. So we're not setting up the contract or, or compiling it or anything like that. This is just how you would kind of pop the contract that's already running. So you've got Cleos here. Cleos is the command line EOS interface uh, tool. And basically what you're going to want to do when you're going to create your token, and I made up this uh, very, very clever um, fake scenario. So say uh, somebody called her Alice. She's uh, starting a decentralized dog walking business, and she wants to create her own token. Uh, so what she's going to do is she's going to use EOS to push an action to EOS IO that token. Now this is the account that the token is at. Similar to how on Ethereum you have a uh, you know, public key with an account or with a uh, contract living on it. Um, so this is the instance uh, of the, uh, we're not, it's the address that the contract is at. And you're basically pushing a create action, which we saw earlier in that interface. Uh, and it has some arguments here, Alice being the uh, token owner and uh, the outs through the, the float or the, uh, the amount that publicly outstanding token is uh, a million and DOG dog is the symbol. So she's now created her contract and uh, now what she's going to do, since she's a founder, she's going to push an issue action which is going to allow her to um, grant herself tokens. So uh, with this um, one here you'll see it's same, same. she's uh, granting this to herself, so she's the recipient, she's giving herself 500,000, uh, so she's the founder, and uh, specifying obviously that it's a DOG uh, coin, and there's also a metal field, so you can you know, explain why you're giving yourself some of these belt coins. Uh, and right at the end, um, I forgot to explain this, this is just the permission that you're specifying with the given action. So like, in the case of the contract, initially EOSI you know, with that token, uh, this is the um, you know the owner of, of, of the contract instance has to uh, you know, do the um, has to uh, have the permission. But later on, you know, as, as I believe when, the, uh, when you create new inst when you create new um, tokens within that contract, then the owner of the token has to uh, has to be the um, sort of authorizing party. So right um, now she's uh, uh, oh the next thing. Transfer. So now she wants to hire an employee. She's hiring. She hired Bob to walk dogs. She wants to give him 100 tokens to reward him for his service. So what she's going to use is uh, EOS again to push uh, the EOSIO, uh, or I'm sorry, the transfer uh, action to the contract. And in this case, it's pretty similar, except now there's uh, the from and to parties are there. So this is Bob is the name of the account uh, that Bob owns. He's received 100 dog coins and. Uh, there's obviously a memo there, so pretty much the same there. And then now, if Bob wants to go and check his balance, he can use uh, Cleos again as a handy little interface, um, sort of built in, where you can uh, query the blockchain for balances of uh, different currencies. So he's asking again the uh, EOS side of uh, how many dollars and so you can respond. So yeah, I think um, it's pretty pretty easy. I mean, it's uh, and it's great because. I think, you know, what what I was originally trying to do and what I was hoping to be presenting today was a, a, a sort of a use case where I was extending the contract, so using like, inheritance to create um, a new version of, of, the, of the, the, the token contract that would have uh, the ability to, um, you know, add some, implement some extra features, which I'm probably not going to go into now. I hope to present this next, next time. So, uh, yeah, it's like, it's a pretty extensible Nice, stable way of, of doing things, and uh, it's nice that you was had it. I believe from from launch. Uh, so, yeah, it's very cool. Uh, so, the next slide. I think um, like what are we going to see next? Obviously, developers are going to get on the platform. They're going to build interesting applications with the libraries and the uh, the contracts, the mobile the contracts that Eos has already provided. Uh, but what I would really like to see, and I'm sure I, I don't know what the, the plans are internally, but like. Creating more of these mobile link contracts and uh, you know making more of this stuff available, so it's really easy for developers to you know pull um, battle-tested uh, patterns and libraries into their contracts and build them 
the things without having to worry about um, you know, so much of the uh, you know, security issues that are inherent to this stuff. So I'm, I'm really excited to see what happens. Uh, and I hope you guys are too. Thanks. Good job, Ross. Thanks a bunch. So there's a lot of new stuff to learn. Um, those Cleo's commands are around in tutorials, but hang out with Ross and you'll get them later on. Yeah, there's, there's a great tutorial. Most of this is stolen from that tutorial uh, that's on the US site, so you can uh, go and tell the jokes. It's open source. Yeah, feel free. All right, so now for our next uh, talk, we're going to bring up Ira. Ira from WorkPoint. And the uh, final talk title was two options. <laughs> the, the dawn of mass adoption. The dawn of mass adoption. There's a subtitle. There's a yeah. subtitle. Dawn 3, 4, point 2. All right, Ira. Oh, Ira's good. If anyone needs to get a drink, use the restroom. <laughs> Take a minute. Yeah. Sorry, I'm Usually I don't use mics because <clears throat> I do have a booming voice, but <laughs> just have to prove it. Uh, so I am curious though, how many guys came here from, uh, from downtown? Just to show you. Okay. And then how, how many people came from, let's say, half hour away? Or... What's up? Okay, cool. Well, they yeah, representing <laughs> the right hand, west side. But I love all sides. <laughs> All right, well, okay. thank, yeah, we're good to go. <clears throat> thank you for coming. Uh, so yeah, the, the title I ended up going with is The Dawn of Mass Adoption. And the subtitle, The Dream of the 90s is Alive in Blockchain. So if anyone has watched Portlandia, a <laughs> subtle reference there. Uh, let's see if this. I'm going to try this one more time. If it doesn't work, then Angel will be my remote. Just give us the wallet, Ira. <laughs> we want it. You know we want it. Angel. All right. Yeah, it could be. All right, ready? Yeah. Bam. I'll just point it in the link. All right. Uh, so I am Ira Herman. I'm a developer, an entrepreneur, a teacher. Uh, I work with Fred and the team at WorkCoin. And so you can check out what we're doing at WorkCoin.net. 
uh, and you can check out our new wallet that I'll, I'll show you a little bit about at the end here, uh, eoslinks.com. And uh, I also teach classes, so I, I'm a techie, I'm a programmer, uh, I'm also big into kind of the user side of things and making sure that people get value out of the apps that I'm creating. And so we'll talk about that in the slides. And uh, I teach a bunch of classes, uh, General Assembly, and so I've taught a bunch of the immersive 12-week boot camp classes, I've taught 10 of those. Uh, I've taught uh, part-time classes, we like acronyms at GA, so FEUD is front-end web development, I've taught back-end web development, uh, I've taught the JavaScript class, I do a bunch of corporate and enterprise training contracts now. And I uh, also work with these, uh, these guys at Sense, uh, during the Sense Token ICO, so that was fun. And uh, fast forward a bunch, or I guess rewind, I worked at Microsoft back in the late 90s. <coughs> it was really easier if I was controlling it. But... All right, so everywhere I look, I see parallels between the 90s internet and blockchain. So kind of like there, like Neo with Matrix, he just sees the Matrix code. And Haley Joel Osment sees dead people. <laughs> I just see 90s wrecked? parallels. What's that? Is that the wrecked? Did you see everybody being wrecked? Everybody being wrecked? What's up? Oh, uh, no, I... Like making it. Maybe, but I also see the companies that survived the wreckage, like Amazon and Google, being the huge dominant players. Uh, so. so right now, a small number of people actually use blockchain. And it's really exciting. We've got all these people using CryptoKitties and Ethereum and building dApps, and it's super awesome, but there's just a small subset of people who are technical enough, basically, to use that. If we want mass adoption, we can actually learn a lot from the past. But first, we have to go back. <laughs> to go back and find <laughs> So this is broken into three sections. We're going to start with the past and then we'll do the present, and then we'll do the future. So back in the 90s, I worked at Microsoft. Not all of Microsoft ideas were good ones, like Clippy. Sometimes they just pop up for no reason at all, like now. Or Microsoft Bob, that was a classic flop. Or how many of you guys ever saw this, a blue screen to death? One of my favorite things used to be to go take pictures of uh, like on buses or public signs or like even in Times Square, like blue screens. Either it was either that or like Norton or Antivirus wanting to update. It just ruined those kiosks and informational displays. But they did get some things right. Like moving from DOS, which is this, before we continue on. I mean, we're talking about Clios, and, and we can do a lot of powerful stuff, and it's a godsend for us who are technical and used to black scary screens. But to most people, they see this, and it's danger. <laughs> so they move from that to this, to a GUI, to Windows. And they were smart enough with Windows to do things like put Minesweeper and Solitaire and Paint in it so that it was fun for people, and they didn't have to issue a bunch of commands from a terminal. Is anyone here running a Nobel Network server? How many of you know what a Nobel Network server is? Oh, awesome. A couple of old school people. Uh, so that was Nobel Network. I'm actually certified in Nobel Network <laughs> <laughs> in the 90s. No? no, no, no. Continue. Uh, that's because Windows Server killed it. And so you don't hear about Nobel Network generally anymore because Windows Server killed it. It happened back when I was at Microsoft. And 20 years later, Windows Server still dominates the enterprise market. So even though we're by the coast, so we all use Macs, most of the country and the rest of the world, uh, very Microsoft-centric. The big enterprises are running Windows networks and Windows servers. So how did they do it? Well, one of the main things they did that we can learn from is they made it easy to put a Windows server or a Windows machine on a Nobel Network network. So either if you wanted to connect to a network server, which the network server served up files and folders, and it also lets you log in as different user accounts. So if you wanted to connect from a Windows machine, they had something called CSNW, Client Services for Network, let you connect to that and access it. If you wanted to add another server to your network, 
instead of buying another network server, you could buy a Microsoft Windows NT server, and you could run something built in for free called GSMW, or Gateway Service for Netware, and you can configure your Windows server to pretend it's a network server and speak the same protocol and fool all the clients that were connected. So that's how they snuck in. They made it easy to do that. And there was also some, also some financial advantage. You didn't have to buy licenses for the network server if you used a Windows server pretending to be network. Uh, what about WordPerfect? Any WordPerfect users here? <laughs> well, currently? <laughs> Okay, we got the point, enough about Microsoft. So remember when Yahoo was the dominant search engine back in the 90s? 1999, Yahoo looked like this. Give you a moment to take that in. There's a lot going on here. So yeah, there's a lot happening on that homepage. Simplicity wins. This is what we keep seeing. Simplicity wins pretty much every time. I was going to say simplicity wins every time, but I knew you're a bunch of smart people and someone would have figured out at least one instance where it didn't. So not saying that, but simplicity usually wins. So Google. Google came out. This is Google also from 1999, and it's a much different page. So it's actually so simple, they had to add the copyright notice at the bottom so you know the page is done loading. So go, can you go back a slide? So yeah, the page was so simple, and people were used to all of that garbage, the directory and all the other services on there, <clears throat> that when Google launched, they actually had some usability tests, and they sat people down in front of it, and people loaded the page, and they watched them to see how they'd interact. And so the people that went to interact with it, they were just sitting there staring at it. And so Google like, asked them, what are you waiting for? And they're like, waiting for the page to finish loading. It's done. <laughs> They added copyright to Google. <laughs> All right, so what can we learn from this? Make it simple. But simple takes more time. But it is worth it. If we want people using our app and getting value out of it, it's worth it. Uh, I love this quote by Mark Twain. Maybe some of you guys have heard this or used this. I didn't have time to write a short letter, so I wrote a long one instead. Simplicity takes time. It's easier to make something complicated and big and have a lot of stuff in it. To actually pare it down and make it simple looks like you didn't spend time on it, but it's the opposite. It took way more time. So now let's take a, a look at crypto right now. The present. Speaking of simplicity, how simple does this look for most users? Blockchain explained. You got blockchain, you got a wallet, you got an address, verified cryptocurrency mining. Uh, you've got ICO, trust, network, transaction, smart contracts. There's a lot going on. And I love blockchain technology. It's amazing. But I'm also a developer. Most of you guys are developers. So we love it. But most people are not. Most people actually don't care to know. They just want the end effect, and they don't want to have to understand what all this stuff is. So let's get set up on CryptoKitties. <laughs> And I love CryptoKitties, too. It's fun. I, I own some CryptoKitties. It was a fun thing. I showed my girlfriend at the time, and she's like, oh, I love it, because of the artwork, and she loves cats. Uh, and then I was like, here, you set it up on your computer. She refused to do it. So I still have her CryptoKitty as a result, because she didn't want to go through this process, even though she really loves cats. Uh, so CryptoKitties. First, if you've never done this before, you got to get MetaMask. you got to add it to Chrome. you got to be using Chrome. Uh, MetaMask been added to Chrome. You got to create a new vault, and you got to understand what a vault is. That's new terminology. That's different. Then, then you're creating it, uh, and then the vault's created, and you got to copy down your seed words. I'm copying it. Is that still uh, That's a problem. Uh, yeah, I, I like I like that you try to copy it. So, <laughs> I'm very secure and conscious. So that's, yeah, go, go back. Go back. So this, this was actually a screenshot from the MetaMask video. And so these are known safe seed words that are on YouTube right now. But I love that you tried to hack it. Uh, uh, transaction. Um, so this pops up with your wallet. 
And uh, so I created a vault, but now I got a wallet, whatever that is. And then there's no transactions, I have no balance. Cool, welcome to CryptoKitties. I have this wallet address, I don't understand what that is. I put in my email address, my nickname, I submit it. When I try to complete this form, this sign message pops up and I have to pay just to create an account. Um, so I have to actually sign it. And if I don't have any Ethereum in my MetaMask wallet, then I'm screwed here. So I have to go have another wallet or go to an exchange, maybe transfer it. Uh, Fred, how long does that transfer take? How long did it take today? Three minutes. So yeah, at three minutes best case, uh, we, we're doing some transfers, a lot of exchanges will batch the transaction so they won't even send it for an hour. So it could be an hour before I can just create an account. Or I think the buyer of Coinbase might take a week for the bigger Coinbase to uh, Yeah, so, so yeah, it might take a week if you have to buy it on Coinbase. Um, there's a lot of barriers to entry here, so. And that's just to create an account. I haven't even seen the kitties yet. I'm just trying to create an account. I've already had to install the software, create a vault, send Ethereum to it, write down my seed words, go through some scary screens. I had to sign a transaction and pay gas to do that. And now I have an account. Now I can see the kitties. So I, I, I was going to do all the steps, and I was like, screw it. Just the account is plenty. We get the idea. There's so many steps to it. Uh, all right, so how many people are actually going to do all that? How many of you guys did that? Okay, cool. So a group of developers, most of us, did it. But most people that I know won't, won't do it. And they're tech savvy. They use apps. They use iPads. They're, they're up on the latest. They recommend websites and apps to me, but they don't want to go through all these steps. So people do get stopped very easily. And we need to reduce points of friction. And this is something that is interesting. The more I learn, uh, I'm really into like user experience and just kind of human behavior. And I like to figure out like, why did I buy that Cinnabon? Or you know, what motivations are happening? What are the tricks that the companies are using? Or how can I hack that to improve my life? Uh, one of the books I read is Getting Things Done by David Allen. And uh, he, he kind of pointed out something interesting. And it's that if you have a physical filing cabinet, if it's in swivel distance from your desk, you'll use it. But if it's like, you gotta stand up to walk over to it, or it's the next room over, you won't do it. Most people won't do it. And it, it's just a tiny difference. It's a subtle difference. It doesn't take much to stop us. Amazon tests this constantly. And so you guys, I see a lot of heads nodding. You guys know that like, cart abandonment is an issue. And so with cart abandonment, Amazon makes it as frictionless as possible because at every step of the purchasing process, people will drop off and not come back and buy the product. So you want as few steps as possible for people to actually follow through and complete it, because it doesn't take, doesn't take much for people to get turned off. So crypto now continued is signing and paying fees, signing transactions, paying fees every step along the way. It's users asking, what is all of this? Like, why do I care? Why do I need to know this just to buy a kitty? And why isn't this working? Lots of, it, I mean, we run into stuff not working and, and we're super techie. So we can do better, especially with EOS. And this is, this is why we're talking to the EOS meetup group. So the future. That was easy. That was easy, thank you. Uh, so EOS, Actually, I, I see it as kind of this huge thing, and, and I'm sure you guys too, it unlocks a lot, it unlocks the future. So in the 90s, uh, when you had to connect to the internet and you had to dial, you had to get a modem, you had to make sure no one was on the phone, you had to dial up. I used the internet back in the days before there were web browsers and before it was graphical. So it was a dark terminal and there was you know cool stuff you could do, but it was a different world once we had higher speeds and once you actually had a graphical internet, that became appealing to the masses. So EOS is lightning fast. It's got less than one second transactions. Uh, so that, that's amazing. There's at, at 500 milliseconds per block, lightning fast transactions. That allows us to do a lot. Fred's making a bunch of videos about that as well, just like how, how many seconds there are in the day. Uh, 80,000? 80, yeah. 
And uh, and it's funny too because we're doing we're doing videos of like you know, on, on Ethereum we're transferring. So we're transferring on EOS. It's like that. We're transferring on Ether and or Ethereum. And three minutes doesn't sound like a long time, but when we're recording a video and we're sitting there waiting, <laughs> that's a long time. It's free. There's no transaction fees or gas, and that's amazing. The whole staking system. It's amazing. And that's something that we can explain or abstract away for mass adoption, uh, but that lets us do micropayments. It lets us sign transactions without paying gas for it. That's amazing. Uh, and it's got the friendly addresses. We don't have to keep track of a long string of hexade hexadecimal or numbers and letters. Uh, users can have the 12 character names. In the future, it's going to be even less. And that's a lot simpler, because that reminds me of the internet where we had IP addresses, but the system that made it usable was DNS, where we could go to Amazon.com instead of 12.74.63.55. DApps should be as easy to use as apps. Is that a bold statement? And they should be mobile. So CryptoKitties is not mobile. You, you got to use a web browser. You got to be on a desktop. You got to use the plugin, and it's amazing, but it's not the future. So some keys that that I think are for mass adoption: uh, our apps should be mobile accessible. Uh, run a bunch of websites. Most of our traffic comes from phones. Mobile is what most people use most of the time. It should be easy. Each app should stand alone without separate plugins or other steps and hurdles people have to go through. Should have no need for those plugins or complex configurations. And they should work just like other apps. In fact, you shouldn't be able to really tell the difference between a DAP and an app. It should just all be apps, but they're happen to be using blockchain on the back end. But they also have all the advantages of blockchain. They're secure. Uh, they can cross international boundaries. If I want to Venmo someone in Israel, I can't do it. Uh, if I want to Venmo or use all of these apps across boundaries, it can be difficult depending on countries and different currencies and jurisdictions. So it's nice to be able to have a global network and global currency that we can use. Uh, yes? What about if they with banking regulations? Yeah, yeah, totally. There's so the question was, wouldn't that be an issue with banking limitations yeah. and regulations? And so that kind of depends on a per country basis as well. So it's uh, per each country we can follow laws. And this is something too. I, I've been interested in this stuff for a while, but it's been like the early days of the internet, where it's been like you got to be you're an outlaw, or it's the dark web. It's for drug dealers, or it's illegal. And and I'm you know starting to see our U.S. government coming around and actually making reasons why it's legal. So that there's there's a long way to go still, uh, but we can comply with laws in different areas, and it's and so users can comply. And that's something too where you know to comply with those laws, the conversion from crypto to fiat, fiat to crypto, there are gateways for that. There are banks or there are other organizations for that, and and they can go through all of the regulations. Uh, we can do asset transfer, can have no central bank or institution uh, controlling assets or doing things like PayPal and freezing business accounts when we're just trying to do legitimate transactions. So I'll just show you, here's what our team at WorkCoin has been working on. Uh, and this is kind of the vision we see and we're building towards this future of apps that are simple, they're fast, they're mobile. One more. Very simple. Uh, should have hooked up the speaker.
So we, we purposely did that like live filmed uh, on actual phones because it is it is running. We do have some beta testers on it right now. We're slowly releasing more test flight invites as we go. Uh, but the idea is we've put this down, we've put this in front of people who are not experts in blockchain and they've just been like, oh, so what? It's like Venmo. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like Venmo, but it's on blockchain, but it seemed as simple as Venmo. EOS allows us to do this stuff lightning fast. Uh, let's, yeah, click at the preview thing. Sweet. So here is the slide. So I'm inviting you, let's build the future. Let's make it simple, let's make it mobile. And with EOS, we can do all of these things. That is it. So if you guys want more information about what we're building, workcoin.net, or you can sign up for the beta of our wallet, uslinks.com. Thank you. Questions for either presenter? Aria? Yeah. Um, well, I asked, I cheated. I asked Ross this question uh, by the water. So one of the one of the most annoying things about Ethereum contracts, there was a lot. But once you publish it, all you can do is very little things like pause it and unpause it. And we were talking about, you know, are there in the EOS contracts more abilities to update once you once you publish the contract? That was my first question. The second question is, will you on a mobile basis be using Apple's vault uh, for any functionality? <laughs> Good questions. Uh, with the contract functionality, there's, I think none of, none of us are super experts on it yet, yet Ross probably could tell you more, uh, but there are more features that we see on an EOS uh, that we've seen on, on other networks. There's things like time locking, you can do things like staking, and it takes three days to unstake. Uh, with transactions, there's things like that too, where you can time lock or reverse transactions for a certain period of time. Uh, and then the other thing was the secure vault you said with, with iOS. Yeah, it, just, it seems like it's just yeah. there waiting for crypto. Right? All right, so secure enclave, right? Talk to us. Uh, right? Secure enclave is a big question mark, right? Because secure enclave, it really is secure because the keys are created in the secure enclave. That's great, but the bad thing about the secure enclave, the bad thing about the secure enclave is. You can never get your private key that's stored in your secure enclave. So, what does that mean for EOS? Well, it means because we have the owner key and we have the active key in, in EOS, there is a possibility that I could say, here's your owner key, copy that, and let me generate a active key inside the enclave that you'll never get to see. But you can use it all you want. That's one way to go, okay? The only problem with that is that's fine as long as you're using that particular phone, you know, as your main device. But the minute you need to go to another device, you're now going to need the owner key, which you really don't want to be using all the time in a lot of different devices. That kind of kills the idea of the owner key. So, you know, I don't know. Like, the answer is, I know Block One's going to come out with some stuff on, uh, on the secure enclave. But my gut feel is the fact that you can't get that private key and we really need this inter-device capability, right? Because I need to take my wallet that's on links or that's on gray mass or that's living inside a work coin or inside a sense, and I need to access that same wallet from multiple places. So I don't know. I, I would love to see how that works for the secure enclave, but I don't know the answer to that. Right. Uh, yeah, so I saw in Fred's Facebook post that you know the first thousand links users are going to get a free account, but otherwise, in a lot of applications, you need to sort of buy your EOS account using EOS, and that goes against sort of the, you know, they, get, they don't even know they're using a different type of app. What's the right. solution to that? <laughs> Two, two solutions. Right. Two solutions. So the look. I mean, I am the one thing I am paranoid about. Right. The one thing that will kill this whole EOS thing 
is these round prices. Right? That is the danger to EOS. And nothing gets me more upset than looking at that RAM telegram group. We have all these guys sitting there going, when moon? Okay? Like, I love buying it and buying it at 35 cents. Get out of here, man. Like, you're, you're hurting the rest of the community by your insane speculation. Okay? 7x, though. Huh? Uh, you made 7x. Uh, yeah, okay, great. So, you know, I, so there's a lot of proposals being bandied around, right? And I can tell you for sure that, you know, it, you're kind of going against the Federal Reserve here, which is Dan Larimer, because <laughs> Lock One does not want EOS to have a $10 entry fee at the entrance, okay? They, they do not. So if you're speculating on RAM and you're betting that that number is going to go from ten to twenty dollars. Well, it may tomorrow, right? But I guarantee you, the Federal Reserve is going to come in and change the rules on you, and that that number is going to be close to zero, <laughs> you know, like it used to be, right? So I just think, look, I hope that Block One. If I can tell you that I talked to a number of people, and I can tell you that it's it's very high on their list. Now the question is, how do you how do you do it, right? So how do you how do you stop it? Well, one way is you just tell the block producers to add more RAM, right? So right now, the block producers are not incentivized properly to go add a lot more RAM. So that's the first problem. First way you can address it. The second thing is you can tax RAM. You can say, guess what? If you buy RAM and you sell it, you owe us 50% capital gains tax. And maybe that tax even goes up if we're kind of at the 90% level. So that's the gray mass sort of proposal. There's another thing is, well, you don't buy RAM at all, you lease RAM. I think like that's, we're not really buying anything. So the whole- I'll well, find a way to manipulate that too. And so, there will, but look, my only point is this. It's going to change. I think we have to believe, like all things, that, that we're in an early phase. I think it's gonna go change. I am confident that we, over a period of 90 days, we as app developers uh, and DAP developers, we I mean, we have a massive uh, incentive against high RAM prices, right? So I think if RAM prices are ten dollars, we can all go back to doing our day jobs because I I don't think EOS will work. And so that that barrier will stop everything, but I, I don't think it's going to be there. So I'm 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 pretty hopeful that we are, you know, three months from now we won't see this and. Yeah, we'll subsidize a little bit, but at $10, you're right, I'm not going to give out a million accounts at $10 each. Do I need an EOS account to use WorkPoint? Uh, yeah, so you will need an EOS account, right? So so basically, so one of the things is, this is something I think you should all think about, right, as developers. One of the questions is how, and Ira alluded to this, and, and so we went through the same phase, right? So we we built this sort of app with Meta, Mask, and Ether, so we're like, it, MetaMask, telling a normal user to install MetaMask, transfer Ether, wait all that, it doesn't work, okay? Now, uh, we, we, you know, we, we battle tested it with people, they just don't get it. They don't understand how to use MetaMask. Now, there's a MetaMask for EOS, I'm sure you're all aware, it's called Scatter. It's, it's good, right? But telling a user to install a second piece of software to use your system it's not great, right? So what alternative do you have? It's confusing now too, because it has right. your address and it's got like... And then the immediate thing is like, what is the relationship right. between that thing and your thing? Why do I need two... Can I, you know, like, everybody gets confused. So the, the solution to this is to have your app hold keys, right? And to be a wallet. Well, guess what that means? That means a couple things. First of all, it means that so since all the development now used to be websites, right? And it's not gonna work. You can't just put it on a website and have it store your keys. At least I don't think you should, right? That means you should at least use Electron and do it as a desktop app, right? And so you cannot just do mobile web either. You know what I mean? Like, you gotta build an app. You have to, you know, if you're not using secure enclave, just save this key encrypted on the keychain, you know? So, so I think if we have to rethink how we're gonna do our apps. And I think we're going to need to build. You don't have to build the you know most consumer friendly wallet. If, if 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 you know you should build a wallet that's appropriate to your app, but you need to be able to import a wallet and export a wallet from your app. 
And that's why for WorkCoin, what we're now doing is we're building that wallet that you saw, that sort of linked wallet, into WorkCoin. So WorkCoin is now not a website. It's an Electron app that you download on Windows, Linux, or Mac. And then we have a iOS version with the same capability, right? So you'll need a wallet to do work right now. I think you will need a wallet to do most of the apps that you guys develop. You know, you can need some kind of wallet if you're going to be moving around your utility tokens or other tokens. And so that's kind of my view. And the other one thing I would like to say is, I really believe that the other thing that you should all look at is when you're talking about value, you should all look at possibility of stable is I think one of the things that we're going to see more and more of is apps that use stable points to move actual money around. Because again, one of the things that we know, and we've tested this with a lot of people, they don't like getting Chuck E. Cheese token for payment. You know, like my sister is like, Fred, I love this work point idea, I'm a gardener, I'll absolutely use it, but like, what am I gonna do with these tokens? And I'm like, you know, I tried that out with the white and go to. No, I don't want to go to an exchange to get these tokens. What are they worth? I have no idea, you know? So I think that's the thing that's going to change dramatically. And it's change, it'll change in the wallet, too, because if I wanted, you know, hey, we, we you know, we, bet, we went sushi, I paid, you know, you owe me some points, give me $25. Okay, great. Me twenty five dollars, not three yeah, EOS. The exchange you know? rate right now EOS. Uh, oh, now it's only twenty dollars. So right. So I think you know the things. One of the big learnings that we have, and look, we're not done. We're not experts in anything, but we do know that wallets are pretty key. You're probably going to need to integrate a wallet into your app. You're probably not going to need. You're probably not going to just do web sites with Scatter. I mean, I don't think that's going to really work that well. So I would, you know, I think we're all kind of in the same boat. We have to, we have to develop these things that work as standalone solutions. Thanks. And, and I want to along the account uh, question thing too. I do want to mention we do support, and we released a separate video today on social media, uh, the account creation right in the EOS Links app as well. Uh, and so that's part of where we're subsidizing the first thousand accounts. Uh, so you can create it and get on board and everything. People who've never used crypto before can get up and running doing that. Uh, but yeah, in the future, we're looking at EOS making it more accessible to create accounts so that it's not all coming through us. Or uh, there, there's talk about them uh, maybe having an API that we can hit for EOSIO. Or, or you guys can. Yeah. If, if, that, if that's the case, which I think, e, I think EOS want, uh, Block 1 wants People to have that to have the ability to create an account within their app for free. Yeah. So I think that's going to happen, and I think that'll be extremely bullish for the e EOS ecosystem. Right. right. So. The cryptography module, open source, closed source. Uh, signing right now. I don't know. Yeah, the, the signing for the app. The signing for the app. Yeah. Yeah, like in the iOS app, with, with Jacob got working. Uh, well, <laughs> it's not open source. Yeah. No, so what, that's another question. It's like, well, how do you know you're not saving your keys? Right? So everybody's like, so open source is not a guarantee that there's a lot of problems with security with open source. True. Yeah. And I think that the question is more for the developer side. Use it, can they use it in their apps? Well, I don't know. I think that, I think that you're going to see stuff from block one that you will be able to use. Right. Not, not very long. Uh, but, you yeah, know, we'll see. Makes sense. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. Brent. Yeah. Um, so the next step that I think for this API for one stop shop and everything is being able to support some form of exchange, being able to buy and sell crypto. I know I spoke a bit before, but what needs to happen from a technology standpoint for this to be integrated directly into the wallet? So, all right. So, okay. <laughs> how, about, how many people here are familiar with uh, IDEX? Anybody? Okay. Uh, air swap, any of these kind of technologies. Look, one of the things that Vitalik said, I usually disagree with everything that Vitalik says, because I hate it hearing it, but uh, one thing I do agree with him is that centralized exchanges should burn in hell, okay? Because like getting your funds in and out, getting penalized for, they're, they're taking taxes on you for, that don't come out of anywhere. They took a tax from the 
a sense of EOS the other day. I mean, like, where is that coming from? This is like a yeah. They take they take a fee. They take a fee when you do the exchange, and then oh. some of them take a fee when you transfer out as well. Yeah. Yeah. And like someone like hit BTC takes a huge fee. It's a and there's no other way around it because you weren't like you got to get your crypto out. So this is this is the kind of my view of where it should go, right? My view is we should have something a little bit think about a little bit like the zero X protocol, but like a decentralized order book, right? That basically just matches buys and sells, oh, oh, this one completely open source, right? That matches buys and sells uh, on any EOS token. That is EOS token to EOS buy sells, right? And that anybody can inter that anybody can interface with. So that we have a shared liquidity of this thing across all these apps. So now if I'm in my app, right, and I have, you know, uh, I don't know, 50 work points that I want to get rid of because somebody air dropped them into my app, and I just check and it says they're worth uh, you know 10 cents each. I say, great, I'm a seller at I'm a seller at nine cents, you know, for all of my work points. Right. I just put that in the wallet. The wallet just relays it to the cloud to the decentralized order book, you know. And Ira wants to smart his, uh, yeah, smart contract. Ira wants to buy these things, so he tells that cloud that he wants to buy some more coin. He never sees me. We never look at screens. We never look at depth charts or you know any of this stuff. We're just putting these little orders, and they get resolved. Then all of a sudden, they get bing, little push notification. I look at my thing, so I got some more EOS. Is anyone working on the zero X or EOS? Because I know zero X is just appearing. Yeah. So I, and the, I'm starting to build that right now. So that, but I sort of want to build, like zero X to me is like too much. You know what I mean? It's like, they went ICO, you know, they, they go, okay. I don't want to do all that, right? I want to just do something. I don't want to do something that's a whole business. I just want to do something that we can all use, right? To get liquidity. Because I think that would be very, very useful for us to be able to swap tokens, like this central token swap, you know, like a swap meet type thing. That's kind of what I, I see this, and then we just kind of like, we go into this open thing where nobody's making money off of it, but we're just all kind of having liquidity on it, and maybe there's somehow we have to subsidize the EOS that has to be staked for it, you know? And I don't know how to work out that. But I'm not thinking of it as a profit center, but I am thinking about it would be incredibly useful, right? Especially for illiquid tokens, because I think the other thing that's absolutely criminal right now is, you know, Binance charging, you know, X millions of dollars to this. Okay. You know what I mean? Like, so uh, to me, it's like I should have, I should be able to sell my Fred token. If I ever wants to buy the Fred token, and I have a buyer, I have a seller, I should be able to. Do it, you know. So that's my hope, anyways. Are you, you know? submitting this stuff in EOS community projects or to the block of VCs, or are you just using Workcoin uh, resources to? to I'm using mean, Workcoin resources right now, but if you have any any ideas that. That would be, I would love to yeah, get this bill. Is 4% of the inflation going towards community projects? Supposedly, right? I don't know. How, do they, how are those? Yeah, I don't know, right? Like, does anybody? I don't, I don't know either. Uh, there's a repo called Exchange, which okay. Dan Lambert's working on. Okay. I think there's a lot of his time is going into it. Okay. Obviously, he's a father of the chair, so I imagine okay. the code's a big one. Um, I'll take a look at it. it. But it's just Exchange. Okay. Right. Exchange. Right. Forgotten. Yeah. Um, it's not, doesn't have interface or anything. Yeah, so, anyways, I think all this is sort of pretty embryonic. I and mean, look, we have to figure out the rules and the legalities of all this stuff. I don't know all that stuff, right? But I, I do know it would be great if we could all exchange all of our tokens, right, within our apps, because that would make the system work a lot better than it. You know? and, and the other great thing would be this. If you have stable coins, it's kind of a way of selling a token. You know what I mean? And so now all these tokens become super liquid. And I know that you know that's just a big challenge in general, right? It's like a trustworthy stable coin. Yeah, not 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 tethered necessarily, right? But like you know, so these these are the kind of things I think would be great. And you know, and get back, getting back to WorkCoin, the way we see it is. 
if we're going to build something that looks a little bit like a fiber or an upwork or something that, that is that easy to use, right? That I click and what we got to get something where the payment is just just works. Just there's no doubt about it, right? Like you can't have like press a button and you'll get paid later in the month. Like that that instant stuff. Like when you saw that video, the thing that everybody sees that just, they just go, well, it's so fast, right? And I think the thing, the same thing has to be for all our apps. Like, if I submit my thing, it's to go, tick, done, submit it, you know? And then let me, let me rate me, rate it, dum, bum. Oh, I got your money, you know? So, no so, paying gas for that. Yeah, time. and I think that if we can build that into our apps, if we can build that kind of like instantaneous thing, right? Instantaneous, and that's the thing that's missing, right? Because, you know, we all hire people or get hired out of work or something like that. And then it always takes us two weeks to get paid, right? Or to pay somebody, or a month, you know? So if, if instead of that, you have this sort of instantaneous feel, I think that really changes the dynamic. And it may be the same, and you know, it may not be materially different. This kind of, I always said, waiting three minutes feels like the way I was demoing it today. And I, I, said, I said, you know, it's sort of like, on one hand, Ether is sort of like the Pony Express. And then EOS is like the Concord. Now, once you've flown on the Concord, you're not going back to the Pony Express. So, and, and I know all the other arguments against, you know, why it's too centralized and this and that. But at the end of the day, I think convenience wins, and simplicity wins, and that's what we need to build. And if we do this, I think we are, you know, I think we're going to build the next internet. Here, you know what I mean? I, I really, I feel that there's that possibility now with this underlying EOS technology. It's doable. We can, wasn't doable before. What we signed up to do before with Ether, unfortunately, was not doable. I think that Ether kind of let us down. And well, yeah. we need full 100% centralization, and, and you know, there's a cost to that. Like, yeah, there's a place for that, but it's not going to be built internet too. And it's also not Ether because there's been centralization with the hard fork and that. So, that's another so it's, that it's kind of an idealistic, like, oh, we can be completely decentralized, but then who, who maintains the code? Who, who, someone's got to kind of run things in a certain way and have some control, otherwise it's kind of... Yeah, I read an article for ForBoxDBeach.com that was that sort of EOS and Ethereum were like the new Netflix and HBO, where they were sort of running to the middle. They're, they're giving up, they're going to have to both give up certain pieces to where Netflix is because oh, they're going to both become these streaming giants. The we are both sort of going to have to give up some things to actually make it work. Well, we'll see, right? I mean, all I want to do is let's let's all build some actual cool usable stuff. apps. Yeah. Really yeah. cool stuff. If we can build cool stuff, the world's going to take notice, right? Yeah. And that's that's all we we don't need to worry about, you know, these platform wars. So, I mean, but we have to figure out, my thing is like, whatever works, you know? And I, all I know is like, we tried, I think everybody tried, we all tried with Ethereum. We did kind of the, we did what we could, you know? We did what we could with what we got, you know? But like, it's what we were building on before our coin was, we couldn't build it on either. Yeah, MetaMask and everything else. We changed to EOS. Yeah, so. Kind of what we failed, but EOS has delivered. It's delivered so far. Let's. The one thing, and look, I think, I, the one thing is that ran. Like, we got, you be all, and the one thing everybody can do is like lobby those groups, you know, and lobby the guys you know at Block One and Dan and Brock and all these guys, you know, because if we can get those RAM prices, account creation cost zero. That's what has to be a goal. Account creation cost zero, you know. Then we can get to billions of accounts. I mean, I think we can. I really believe that that there is a, a real possibility now that we're going to see a billion users of crypto within 12 months. One billion. Okay. Now that may seem crazy, like because you know we're at 50 million now globally, but look how fast Instagram took off. You know, and like if you can take this app like this plus all all these other apps that are being developed, and it actually works and it's fast and you have gaming stuff, you have all these other apps. We could get to a billion users, especially if accounts are free and transactions happen like that. So it's entirely possible that crypto now becomes mainstream. Uh, I'm betting. Like I feel like that's we now finally have that. Look, 
when we were in the Caymans there, you know, it didn't feel like that was you know, going to happen. Now it's sort of, you kind of have that glimpse, you know. Yeah, you can see a path. You can see a path to that. Yeah. So, all right, guys. Yeah. Thanks. All right, any announcements, shares, anything that anyone wants to just let the group know about or check it out? I know I saw in the group something about EOS Blocks. I don't know if someone's here from EOS Blocks. Uh, you are? Yeah. You want to give us a quick three, five minute, just kind of, so we yeah. can check it out? Um, it looked very interesting. That's, that's yeah, yeah. Idea. So basically, from a top level, I don't have a presentation for you guys tonight. So uh, just like you were saying, every oh, app. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I've been at another event all night. So anyway, uh, with EOS Blocks, what we're trying to do is lower the barrier to entry. Now it's uh, www.eosblocks.com. So scroll down. So show me the components. Yeah, this was the main thing. Right. So basically, we're creating. I like to think of it as Zapier or IFTTT uh, for EOS. So the front end that's being developed right now will allow you to sew these different blocks together. So just as you were just saying that every app will need a wallet created within it, that will be a block that you will, you will be able to deploy in an in a ecosystem to eventually deploy the adapt that you can launch onto the EOS blockchain. So, um, so far, we've built three different MVPs using blocks. Um, one of them is an airdrop tool that basically allows you to spin up an airdrop with, I think, two blocks. Uh, the other one is account creation where you can just use the block within a, a native app or um, application ecosystem to, to spin up apps rapidly. Uh, the last use case that, that we have actually built is a tic-tac-toe game based on the tic-tac-toe smart contract that the loser pays the RAM cost to push the game to the blockchain. So Dan Larrymer actually stepped in and said, uh, this isn't the best uh, <laughs> practice. Uh, this isn't what we're shooting for. But we did get off Dan's uh, radar, you know. So <laughs> in its infancy, uh, we're, we're just building uh, something that makes it easier for, and I hate to use the word noobs, basic or beginning developers to mid level to be able to <laughs> interact in this ecosystem. That's the idea behind this. Thanks, man. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. So, as long as maybe you or a mid level, there's some cool yeah, ideas yeah. coming from people that are outside the space. So, thanks, everyone. Uh, I think it was a real good meetup. I feel very strongly about what Ira and everyone's been talking about, and I see the progression in this uh, third meetup now. We're initially we're talking high level, now we're actually starting to see actual products and actual tools. And it's nice to see the community grow and the actually hands-on products, like usable products. The conversation I've been having a lot lately is that everyone's trying to build step eight and nine. There's a lot of room to build step one, two, and three of the blockchain space. Uh, we're here thinking of how we're going to decentralize everything and we don't even have a wallet there. Right? Yes. Step one, let's start there. So we're, we're doing a bunch of these things that we think are going to be step ones. So if you're new and you think, hey, this is really hard, we'll figure out which piece is the easy part that you need to move forward. And pull all that and ask for help. And that's what this group is for. So we can get some help, present your ideas, and try to sell some cool stuff together and hopefully get grand prices done. All right, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.